Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On that motion, all in favor say aye. It's almost time for the 2024 no. legislative the session. Prevailed. This week, Republican Senate Minority Leader Mark Johnson and DFL House Majority Leader Jamie Long talk about the goals of their respective caucuses for the session. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Even your legislative sessions are typically focused on supplemental spending, policy concerns, and a bonding bill. Joining me to talk about the goals of the Senate Republican Caucus for the coming session is the Senate Minority Leader, Mark Johnson. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Shannon. It's great to be here. The most recent budget and economic forecast in November used the word constrained, citing a structural imbalance in the next biennium, 26-27. The February forecast is about a month away and will result in an even clearer picture. But based on current information, what is your view of Minnesota's economic health? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think when you're looking at the constraints on our state government, uh, that's what we hear a lot about is, oh, we've got all these constraints on, on growing our state government, but what we really have to worry about is our families and the constraints on their budgets right now. You know, a lot of great economic indicators out there, but yet families aren't feeling those. You know, with the high taxes, high fees, the, the groceries are expensive, the gas is still expensive. Uh, we need to really be focusing on what matters to our families in Minnesota. And so that's gonna be our concentration here going forward. Uh, even years like this one are typically bonding years. Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan have released a $982 million uh, proposal for statewide infrastructure projects. Notwithstanding the $2.6 billion infrastructure package that was passed into law last session, what is the Senate Republican appetite for more statewide investments in this session? Yeah, we, we really spent like crazy last year. And I, when I say we, I, a lot of that was Senate DFL, uh, House DFL that, that did a lot of that spending that put us into this uh, unique and stable position with the state right now. When you look at the out years of our budget, it's really concerning because we have taken that large surplus uh, and Senate Democrats have spent that on all sorts of pet projects instead of really focusing on what Minnesotans are asking for. You know, with the spawning bill, we have to look at wastewater. We have to look at drinking water. We have to look at infrastructure. But if we don't have the budget to support it, then we have to start scaling back, making sure that our priorities are addressed in that. And it's not just, uh, you know, wants and, and different things that, that you might find in some of those bonding bills. But we really have to focus on what the important bread and butter issues are across Minnesota. Uh, you know, the bonding committee has been going out, investigating, seeing what, what's needed out there. And there's a lot of need across the state. However, we don't know what our caucus is going to support in that. We have to get into the discussions here during this session uh, and see what that looks like. But uh, there's a lot to, lot to happen this session on that bonding bill. So it's a maybe. It's a maybe. It's, it's a, a maybe. maybe. So the bonding, the bonding bill is the one area that Republicans do have leverage because bills that borrow money require a three-fifths majority. Senator Karn Housley, who is the Republican lead of the Capital Investment Committee, said on last week's program that a bonding bill will be among the last bills to be passed in this session to maximize that leverage. Right. So what are Republicans, Senate Republicans, going to fight for, use that leverage for? Sure. And last year you saw what we used the bonding bill for. I mean, we fought very, very hard on getting our nursing homes uh, the funding that they needed to survive. That was one of the big issues. We saw that in communities, not just the metro area, but in outstate Minnesota, where they were really on their last leg on a lot of these nursing homes, just because of the timing, the way that funds come in, the way that inflation has impacted them. And this is for one of our most vulnerable communities in this state, and it's for our elderly and those who need those services. And so we fought very, very hard to get to that point. Uh, and so we see the value of having that leverage. And we'll use that this year on the needs of Minnesotans. You know, whatever that might be that comes to the surface, uh, right now tax reform is always a big deal. Uh, you know, SRO uh, with our school resource officers, that's also a, a big issue that many people are looking at. Uh, but, you know, mostly what that bonding bill, what we should be doing is making sure that we're investing in roads and bridges and the wastewater like we talked about and drinking water. Uh, but we're not going to give up this leverage uh, just for 
you know, pet projects for, for different, different things that the DFL wants. We got to make sure that this is a balanced bill that represents, you know, rural Minnesota, metro Minnesota, the different communities within it. And we're going to fight very, very hard to get to that point. Uh, last fall, Republicans called for a special session to fix an issue that you just referred to uh, with uh, school resource officers. There was a law change last session that limited the use of force, and that prompted some law enforcement agencies to pull resource, school resource officers from some schools. A special session was not called, but the governor and DFL, DFLers have said that this issue will be solved this session. How does it need to be solved? Yeah, that was one that really threw our schools into chaos right at the beginning of school. I mean, you saw officers being pulled out of schools, some being kept in schools. What does that mean for an officer? What can they do even if they're left in a school? How much liability personally and professionally are they going to be taking on? Uh, a lot of chaos still around this, and, and our law enforcement community is still advising that you stay out of the schools. However, many school districts have said, well, we're going to let you back into that at this point. There are a few uh, cases within um, you know, the legislation that I think we can really look at refining the language in that uh, to make it clear, uh, clear and that all the stakeholders can kind of get on board. Uh, in the Senate, we have Senator Duckworth, who is working very hard to figure out what that compromise looks like. Um, and so I think we'll get there at, at some point, but it needs to happen yesterday uh, because these schools are still wrestling with this issue and really leaving the safety of our schools as a political football of some sort right now. This needs to be done early. Uh, Senator Jeremy Miller has unveiled his latest effort to legalize sports betting in Minnesota. It's called the Sports Betting Act 2.0. As you know, Minnesota is the only state in the region that does not have legalized sports betting. And over the past few years, I have interviewed both Republicans and DFLers with proposals. So there is bipartisan support. Is 2024 the year? <laughs> do you want to take odds on this one? We, can, <laughs> we probably we can do should. That. <laughs> so this is, again, one of those issues that, that keeps coming up that we just can't figure out exactly the right solution for it in, in Minnesota. And I tell you, I get a ton of emails and calls and texts on this uh, issue from uh, folks of all ages uh, on both sides of the aisle. It, it really is one of those issues that has pressure from both, both directions too, both for and against on it. So we've got a couple of proposals uh, and I think Senator Miller has a really nice round proposal that, that takes into account the charities, which is a big, uh, big deal here in Minnesota. Does a lot of our community funding for high, uh, high skating rinks and, and different events across the, the communities. Uh, our tracks, our indigenous tribes, uh, all those different facets. And he does a good job of, of putting together a proposal, I think, that, that really gets to the heart of it. And so we'll see if that has legs. Uh, I see that there's some movement on the DFL on, on votes that uh, we didn't think were going to be coming uh, our way, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here. It's going to be a fascinating uh, year when it comes to sports betting. And finally, in a democracy, it is the right of the party in opposition to dissent to proposals offered by the majority. Last session saw some fairly lengthy floor debates here in the Senate um, as Republican members asserted the right to question, to debate, and to offer alternatives to what was what was being debated. Are we likely to see lengthy floor sessions again this session? Shannon, that was one of the the most, I wouldn't say fun, but just we got to exercise really what the Constitution and the forefathers who drafted that Constitution envisioned last year, where, where we got on the floor and we had the opportunity to really push back against proposals that we vehemently disagreed with. We didn't have the opportunity as we normally do in committees and you know in the back hall discussions. Uh, the DFL really shut their doors to any sort of opposition, and whether that was uh, senators, fellow senators, or even to the public or organizations that represent people. And so the only place that we could really get our voice heard in a lot of cases was on the floor. And so if that's the only place that we can do it, boy, we're going to be down there having some very lengthy conversations. And I think that's going to, going to be something that hopefully they've learned that we can do that. And we'll be working with us uh, more in committee and, and behind the scenes uh, this coming year. Minority Leader Mark Johnson, it is always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon.
lead House sponsor of the Minnesota End of Life Options Act was joined by individuals with terminal diagnoses to advocate for passage of the measure this session. Now the End of Life Options Act would authorize medical aid in dying. The main criteria have remained unchanged since I first introduced the bill in 2015. To qualify for medical aid in dying, a person must be an adult, so they have to be 18 years of age or over. They have to be diagnosed with a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less to live, um, and they could be eligible for hospice still. Um, I have, they have to have the mental capacity to make healthcare decisions and provide informed consent, so people with dementia do not qualify for it. They have to have the ability to self-administer the medication, so injections or infusions are prohibited. And in addition, two providers, uh, at least one of whom has to be a physician, must evaluate the patient and agree that they meet the criteria. My bill has protections built in for both patients and providers, and absolutely nobody is required to participate. This is an individual decision. Ten states in Washington, D.C. authorize medical aid in dying, and we have more than 60 years' worth of data and experience showing that the laws work as designed. They ultimately diagnosed me with glioblastoma. This is the most aggressive terminal brain cancer. Even with standard treatment care, it has a very grim prognosis with a median survival of 15 months. My family and I have already endured brain surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and I currently use this Optune device 90% of the time to target cancer cells. But this is all treatment and it is not a cure. I promised my family that I would fight this ugly disease until there's no hope left and my death is inevitable. So if there are no more treatment options, then I deserve more death options. At some point, the chemo will stop being effective and my cancer will continue spreading. I don't want a long, painful, drawn-out end. I didn't pick this road, but it's the road I'm on, and I want to decide when I've had enough. I never really thought about medical aid and dying before I got sick. Uh, does anyone? I was frustrated by the fact Minnesota does not allow terminally ill people like me the option of a peaceful death. In Washington and in Oregon, less than one half of one percent of people who die use this option. And well over 90 percent of people who do use this option are in hospice, so they work together. And they work together beautifully. But as a person who has death on my horizon and who has seen death, and having seen the law play out in Washington and other states, I feel I should be able to make my own decisions about my death, and I feel that Minnesotans no longer should be denied the option to do the same. DFL majorities in the House and the Senate were able to pass the largest budget in Minnesota history and enact many policy changes during last year's session. Joining me to talk about some of the priorities of the House DFL for the 2024 session is Majority Leader Jamie Long. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So DFLers accomplished a lot last session. This is a, sh a brief and not complete list by any means. You passed a budget. There was a $2.6 billion bonding bill. You codified abortion rights. There's paid family and medical leave, significant investments in education and housing, legalizing recreational ca uh, cannabis for adults. There's more. What is left to accomplish? We did have a historic year and I think are really proud of what we were able to accomplish last year after years of frankly being gridlocked at the Capitol. We were able to, I think, get a lot done that Minnesotans had been asking for and, and demanding for many years. Uh, but there's a lot left to do. So we, we have a long list still to do this year. For one thing, we're going to do a second bonding bill um, and we had not done bonding bills for many years. So that's investing in our public infrastructure across the state. Our, roads, bridges, and universities, et cetera. And then we have a few items that didn't quite get uh, finished last year that we need to uh, make sure we're getting done this year. So one of those is a public option bill. That's a bill that I'm the lead author of. And last year we authorized uh, a report and study to make sure that we were ready to go to draft the final bill. So this year we'll be working on that. So you, and by that you mean universal health care? 
No, it would be allowing folks to buy into Minnesota Care. So oh, okay. Minnesota Care is um, a really successful program we've had since the early 90s and bipartisan program, uh, but it's capped uh, for its income. And so we're looking at ways to remove that cap, allow more people to buy in. So these are folks largely on the individual market or without health insurance who don't have access to affordable health care or the health care that they have they really can't use. So trying to expand access to folks. So that'll be a big focus. We know there's going to be a lot of conversation still on housing. We have uh, still some of the uh, some real challenges and struggles across the state with getting access to affordable housing and the so-called missing middle house of uh, folks who are looking to make that bridge from a starter home. Uh, so we need to do a lot of work there. In the climate space, I think there's still a lot of work to do. And then we also are going to have a really important conversation on uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. So lots of work ahead. Lots of work ahead. Uh, you mentioned a bonding bill. The uh, Governor Tim Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan outlined a $982 million package. Do you have a number in mind yet? Is that about the range you're looking at? I think so. I think we're trying to make sure we're maximizing uh, what we can achieve with the budget room we have. And so we'll know more when the new forecast comes out in February. But I think everybody's on the same page that we want as big a bill as we can afford. And we just have so many needs across the state. Our capital investment committees have been touring the state, meeting with local communities, hearing about their projects. And a lot of these have been waiting in line for years. And we really need to make sure we're taking care of our infrastructure around the state. Now, you mentioned the February budget and economic forecast. It's about a month away, but I, I want to ask you about November's forecast just a few months ago because there was kind of a warning about a structural imbalance in the following biennium, not this budget cycle, but in the next budget cycle. Um, how are you viewing the state's financial and economic health right now, considering the forecast that you do have the numbers on? Well, our health is strong. We have the top rating from all of the credit agencies. We are uh, have a very large um, rainy day fund that is fully funded and we didn't even have to use in the last um, uh, in the pandemic. And so uh, we're in good shape. The this biennium, we do still have a surplus. So we're looking out in years three and four. Um, and one thing that we changed this past year is that we now account for inflation when we're doing budgeting. So we hadn't really been doing honest budgeting in previous years, and, and now we are, which is important. It means that we're not going to be giving our schools or our medical systems less uh, than they would be able to afford going forward. So when we account, fully account for inflation, then we do have this structural imbalance in years three and four. So I think that does mean that we need to uh, proceed with some caution, as the governor has said, and looking at those years, it may uh, change a little bit in the February forecast. Um, but I think we're being very responsible uh, as Democrats with making sure that we're doing honest budgeting and making sure that we're uh, go not going to be putting ourselves into holes in future years. One slide in the November forecast presentation projected an increase in costs for disability waivers. There's also a recent report from the Department of Human Services that said Minnesota's low medical assistance reimbursement rates are negatively impacting mental health services. So these are just two areas potentially in need of additional resources. What do you say about expectations when it comes to things like that? We, we by no means have met the needs of our state, even though we had uh, a historic year last year with the budget surplus that we were fortunate to have and invested that in really important efforts for Minnesotans to help them afford their lives, to help them receive the care they need. Um, we know that we're digging out of, frankly, decades of underinvestment in a lot of areas, in our schools, in our healthcare system, in our infrastructure. And uh, we do budgeting on a two-year cycle, so this year is not um, a big budgeting year. We, we'll have potentially a little bit to spend, um, depending on, on where the forecast comes out. But we're really looking ahead to 2025 and 2026, and I think are going to be making an argument to Minnesotans that we having Democrats in charge means we get things done, and it means that we're able to actually invest in a lot of these programs that have been underinvested in for many years. 
According to Axios, uh, people in Minnesota tried to place bets online in other states where sports betting is legal 1.6 million times last year. There have been proposals to legalize sports betting in Minnesota from both DFLers and from Republicans. Is there a path to legalization in 2024? I think so. I think it's a really important conversation. Uh, Chair Zach Stevenson has been working hard on trying to bring folks together and in the House and make sure that we can uh, find common ground and, and reach agreement. I think that um, the you know GOP with some of the proposals they've had have been underselling the tribes and uh, that's not a position that the House is going to take. We respect tribal sovereignty. We respect the uh, the gaming rights of uh, those nations have had and has um, resulted in a lot of economic opportunity for those uh, nations. And so we're going to be uh, working closely with our tribal partners to make sure that we can get a deal that'll work for everybody. A bill to allow medical aid in dying has already garnered significant press coverage uh, since it passed out of a House Health Committee even before session has started. Is this bill a priority for your caucus? That's a bill I personally support. We haven't had um, the conversation, I think, as a caucus or uh, with the Senate to see whether we have enough support to, to move it forward this year. But uh, I've heard more on this issue from constituents than many others, and it's from doctors, and it's from often patients and individuals who have really sad stories and are facing terminal illness and want to be able to make that choice for themselves. Um, I've experienced situations like this in my family where it would have been helpful for those individuals to not have to suffer for months on end and to have a, a choice for themselves if they were of free mind. So it's an important conversation for us to have as a state, and I'm, I'm glad we're having it. House Majority Leader Jamie Long, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. John Sargent Pillsbury was the founder of the C.A. Pillsbury Mill Company, which was at one time the largest flour milling business in the world. He was also Minnesota's eighth governor. Brian Pease of the Minnesota Historical Society tells us more. John Sargent Pillsbury, the eighth governor of Minnesota, he came to the state in 1855 in his late 20s and immediately began pursuing interests in lumber, real estate, and hardware, eventually co-founding what became the largest flour milling operation in the world. Was he the first entrepreneur to become governor or maybe just the most successful? He, he was not the first entrepreneur. Uh, you can look at William Marshall was into all kinds of different businesses. He was a livestock raiser, editor of a newspaper, ran a bank. But for success, yeah, it's hard to rival Pillsbury's success as that businessman. And that's one of the things you have to understand about him. He had a strong resolve to always succeed and do the best thing possible. So when he started his hardware business, they lost everything in a fire. It was uninsured, so they lost about $40,000. And they were in debt. And he paid that off, you know, year by year. And uh, eventually was able to, you know, make investments in other business ventures and, of course, being successful as part of the, the Pillsbury uh, milling company. I read that it was not just his business acumen that prompted Minnesotans to want him to seek public office, but also his honesty. What did he do to serve the public good before he became governor? Yeah, shortly after he moved to St. Anthony in 1855, he was elected to their city council in 1858. So he served in the in that public, smaller, of course, city government, but then he was well-received and well-liked and uh, became a, a state senator. And so he served for about a decade as that se state senator in the 1860s up to the early 1870s. And then that vaulted him to uh, prominence as a Republican politician and he eventually was elected governor. Governor Pillsbury ended up serving three terms as governor of this state, and that was the longest at that point in Minnesota history. Was he popular? Oh, very much so. And obviously, if you can win three elections, and you have to remember, those were two-year terms. And so that was one thing that, uh, you know, he was able to rest his laurels on was all the successes he had as the governor. And there were a lot of trials and things that were happening in those six years that he was a part of. And, 
had some decision making role in all of that. And what, so what were some of his accomplishments then as governor? Well, w w one thing, and this is more constitutional, is um, they changed the whole bian bi biennium session. So it used to be a one-year session, and they changed that under his guidance to a two-year biennium session. They uh, elevated the years of service for a senator from two years to four years, and also House members were one year, uh, were, was changed from one year to two years. So that all took place during his, his six years as governor. And you also have all kinds of um, events taking place in the state. You have the grasshopper plagues. And so he, you know, he had some finances, of course, with the milling company. And so he took it upon himself to not only give people things or, you know, donate things uh, as part of, part of his public service role, but he got other people to say, we got to help these farmers in the southern part of the state because they are, they're destitute. And so, you know, he, he's a, one of those guys that was so well liked that, you know, they saw not only his political acumen, but also his charity and his idea of helping the people of the state prosper were all important parts of his success. Governor Pillsbury was known as the father of the university, and yet he himself only achieved an elementary level education. What did he do for the university? Well, he was part of the Board of Regents as well. And what was happening is, and this is in the 1860s, um, there was not a lot of financial uh, income coming in. Um, they were defaulting. There was a real serious threat of the university shutting down. And so once again, he took the initiative to disband the existing Board of Regents, created a, a commission to help resolve the debts. And um, basically, he was in charge of that for the three years until they righted the ship, got the University of Minnesota back uh, on its feet, and then, of course, has prospered ever since. So I, what's really interesting co coincidence, too, for this building and the uh, statue of John Pillsbury and the U of M is that was done by the same artist who did the quadriga. That was Daniel Chester French. So they put a statue of John Pillsbury with the title Father of the, Father of the University uh, in 1900, one, one year before he passed away. With his immense wealth, he was known as a generous benefactor and philanthropist, sometimes even anonymously. What were some of the causes that he contributed to? Yeah, he, he was involved with civic engagement and charitable funds, but he also, as governor, um, the St. Peter uh, State Hospital burned to the ground. The session wasn't wasn't meeting that year, so he, out of his own private money, uh, donated that money, was reimbursed by the state, but they were able to find housing for those people in that hospital. And during the grasshopper plagues, he was down there trying to get support for those impoverished uh, farmers who pretty much lost everything. And there's one story of where he was visiting and kind of incognito visiting some of these farms, and there's a, a farmer who didn't have a coat, and he took his overcoat off and gave it to him. And so after that, you know, they're bringing in carloads of train cars of, of foods and supplies for these, these families down in, in western and southern Minnesota. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, Thanks for watching.